We thank him for his many blessings he bestows upon us. We thank him for his loving kindness he shows toward us each and every day. And we bless and we honor his name. Thank you for being present today. Thank you all for tuning in. We pray that God will speak to our hearts to know when we leave the same as they came, that we all leave encouraged, and that we would thank God for being here. Amen? Amen. We honor him and we thank him. We bless him and we praise his holy, holy name. Amen? Thank God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him and we thank him. Are you glad to be here today? Amen. Do you just thank God for what he's done in your life and what he continues to do in your life? Amen. Thank God that he is a God of second chances, that he is a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we can ever ask or think because of his spirit that dwells within us. Amen. So we honor him and thank him. As we turn our attention back to Judges chapter 2, as we look at Judges chapter 2, what we want to pay close attention to is the cycle of sin that the nation of Israel is going through. Amen. How many of y'all know that you can go through a lot of the things you go through because of your own self-inflicted wounds? Because it's by your choice that you choose to take that path. And even though God has already warned you and you took that path anyway, then God is dealing with you based on the decision that you made. Amen. And we can learn some lessons today for how God dealt with his people. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. And because he is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore, we need to pay attention to how God deals with his people. Amen. Because if God dealt with Israel the way he dealt with Israel, we ought to understand how God would deal with his church today. Amen. Because we are his people, at least we're supposed to be. The Pledge of Allegiance has been used in the United States for over 100 years. Yet the 31 word oath recited today differs significantly from the original draft. While you might expect such an iconic display of patriotism to have originated with the founding fathers, the Pledge of Allegiance was only written in 1892, long after they all had died. The idea of a verbal vow to the American flag first gained traction in 1885 when a Civil War uh, veteran named Colonel George Balch devised a version that read, we give our hearts and our, our head and our hearts to God and our country, one country, one language, one flag. Several schools adopted Bouch's uh, pledge, but it was soon supplanted by a salute composed by Francis Bellamy, a Christian socialist and former Baptist minister. After rubbing many churchgoers the wrong way due to the political, his political beliefs, Bellamy left the pulpit to work for a company called Youth Companion a widely distributed family magazine. The publication already had a, a history of rewarding readers who sold subscriptions with American flags. And it tasked Bellamy uh, with creating a pledge to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus' arrival in the New World. So the pledge actually began as a marketing pitch. The pledge was a widespread success with Americans across the country reading Bellamy's words and sales of youth companion surging. The, spread, uh, the speed with which the pledge caught on can be partly attributed to where the country was at that time. Swearing oaths to the federal government had become popular during, the short, during and shortly after the Civil War, which only ended 30 years earlier. Fears about the loyalty of immigrants also played a factor. The Bellamy pledge gained popularity in, in public schools during the 19th and 20th centuries, but it continued to undergo occasional tweaks and revisions. In 1923 and 24, the flag conference changed the wording to read, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. In, 1490, in 1942, excuse me, Congress officially adopted the pledge and decreed that it should be recited while holding the right hand over the heart, instead of what Bellamy had started, which was a Nazi-style salute with the hand raised up and outward. In 1954, after lobbying from the Catholic Knights of Columbus and other groups, Congress added the words under God to the pledge. That same year, President Dwight Eisenhower signed the law on Flag Day. At the time, there was no, no biggest dissent to adding under God. But in subsequent de decades, there have been lawsuits concerning whether this amounted to a government establishment of religion violating the Constitution's First Amendment. 
So far, the United States courts have disagreed. The Pledge of Allegiance totally reads, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, meaning united, with liberty and justice for all. So the question becomes this, has there ever truly been a nation under God? In other words, has there ever been a nation that truly submitted to the sovereignty of God and obeyed his rules, laws, regulations, commandments, as well as his spoken and written word? The obvious answer is no. But perhaps the closest was the nation of Israel, but we know how bad they fail, which is why God created a new covenant through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Israel had a perfect God, Jehovah himself. They had a perfect law, God's word, and a perfect land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And yet, they still fell miserably. A little bit of background of this chapter, as we stated in part one of this sermon, the purpose of the book of Judges was to demonstrate divine judgment on Israel's apostasy or turning away from God. More particularly, the book of Judges recorded Israel's obedience to Yahweh's kingship as meditated through her sovereignty appointed and spirit empowered leaders. It also records Israel's disobedience to Yahweh and her worship of Canaanite gods, which resulted in Israel's failure to experience divine blessing and the full conquest of her enemies. The Canaanite influence had such a profound effect on Israel that it led to her spiritual as well as moral decline. The Bible does say that bad company corrupts good character, does it not? You have to be careful who you hang around and who you hang out with, amen? God warned Israel way back then that all those Canaanite na nations didn't, didn't do them any good. And he never wanted them intermingle or intermarry with them. He never wanted them to adopt the same uh, religious beliefs that they did. But fast forward to today. In our sermon today, we will contrast Israel with America. When America was first founded as a nation, many Christians at that time viewed America as the new Israel. There are many who still hold to that belief today. In their eyes, they viewed America as a divinely appointed nation and given uh, land from God. As a result, they believed they were God's people, although their actions prove otherwise. Israel was instructed by God to treat the stranger, which is the non-Jews, as one of themselves and let them live in the land. And for the stranger who dwell among you and who bear children among you, they shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. Only if America would have paid attention to that. We are, we are a nation of immigrants, are we not? Now, we realize that many people came here by their own choosing, but black folk came here because somebody brought them and forced them into slavery. Did they not? But if those people had really been true Christians, anybody that was here and anybody they brought in, they would have treated with the respect and love of God and gave them the dignity of the fact that they were human and God created them. And they were created in the eyes of God. Amen? So today's message entitled, one nation under who? Part two. So the question I have for you today is this. How does the book of Judges describe the failures of a nation that is supposed to be God's nation? Now, these are the same questions and statements that I posed two weeks ago. Amen. When we did part one of this. Amen. But part one, the, the point number one is this. America has failed to appreciate the land just like Israel. Amen. Could you imagine? The reason why the United States exists today is because of what was going on in Europe at that time. And many of the people at that time didn't want freedom of religion. Many of them wanted freedom from religion. So don't ever get it twisted understanding the founding of this country. Amen. Because many people ran from Europe because in Europe, as you know, what's been in the news lately is the Queen of England passed away. Amen. And so. What you understand about England, it, the way England is set up is England is run by a monarchy, a king or a queen. All right. And so in that time that America was founded, it, it, churches were forced to follow and be under the government because in, in England, the government and the state are under the same umbrella. So the church and state is, is, is a lot the same. So the taxes from British people help uphold the Church of England, all right? And so this, when this country was founded, that's why I, they wrote into our Constitution not to allow that to happen, even though it originally happened in, in the 
original colonies where if you went to a church in that community, then your taxes went to pay for the upkeep of that church. And so fast forward to where we are today. We still don't understand how history has played a role in how we are and where we are today. Amen. But if we ever going to pay attention, because if we call ourselves, we think that we're this Christian nation that we claim to be all the time, then then God is going to hold us by those same standards of what we claim we are. Amen. But we got to be careful because you can claim something that you're really not. And you can think you are something just like you can think you're a believer and you're really not. You may know all the lingo of Christianity. You might carry the biggest King James Bible around with you. You might know and quote scripture, but that doesn't mean you're a believer. Amen. And so this is how Israel was at that time. They were more of a fake nation than a real nation of God. And this kind of reminds you of the United States these days, does it not? Because if they believed this, that God had uh, put, uh, given them land and create, to create this whole new nation, we don't appreciate this land because look how we treat it and look how we pollute it. Look how we treat our neighbors. We really don't appreciate the land that God has given us and allowed us to be a sovereign nation about 250 years ago. Look at verse 1. It's a recap. What we really want to get to is the second part of these verses, but I want to do a quick, quick recap from two weeks ago. So the first point is this. America has failed to appreciate the land uh, just like Israel. Verses 1 through 5, it said, Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, led you into the land which I swore unto your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Verse 2 says, as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become a, as thorns in your side and their gods will be a snare to you. If you want to know what's going on in Israel to this very day, is this that they violated this principle way back then and they're still fighting to hold on to land that God had given them. How do you fight to hold on to something that you say God gave you? You say God gave you a house, but you're fighting to hold on to it. You say God gave you your family, but you're fighting to hold on to it. Why is that? Why do you fight for something that's already yours? It's because you don't use what you've been given for the purpose it was given. Amen. And when you do that, then things don't turn out the way they should. At least definitely not how do you want them to. Verse 4 said, when the angel of the Lord spoke the, uh, these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. The only problem about them lifting up their voices and weeping is these are those fake, phony tears. Amen? As I said to you two weeks ago, the fact that if you got children or grandchildren, you know what this means. And I talked about our granddaughter journey and how when she wants her way, she puts out these fake tears. Now, they real tears, but they fake because nothing hurting on her. Maybe her feelings, but because she ain't getting away. And she would cry at the drop of a hat. She, she, she cried just like that on a dime. And as soon as she gets away, guess what? The tears dry up. Don't mean to follow rules. It's just I want my way. The problem with this is this is what was going on here. These were fake tears. They were hurting, but the reason why they were hurting, it was self-inflicted. Amen. They brought this on themselves because they did not obey the Lord. Verse 5 says, so they named that place Bochim, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. So again, how does this book of Judges describe the phase of a nation that is supposed to be a Christian nation? The second point is this. America has failed to obey the word of God, just like Israel. Just like Israel. From our founding, we place uh, God on our money and God we trust, but we don't trust God with our money. You can't hardly go any place and not find a Bible somewhere. You can't go to a hotel and not find a Bible there thanks to the Gideons. Even, even when officials uh, take public office, the first thing they do is they pull out a Bible and swear on a Bible. Knowing they're lying, but to put their hand on the Bible. It's a matter of one that their hand don't burn, bust in the flames for the depth of lying that they're doing because they know they're not going to do right. Because politicians will tell you anything you want to know just to get your vote. 
And once they get in the office, they do everything what, uh, than what you had put them in there to do. Again, America has failed to obey the word of God, just like Israel. Look at verse 6. It said, when Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. All of the tribes were given land except the Levites. Now, the reason why the Levites weren't given land is because Levites were the priests and the temple workers. And because of that, their job was to lead the people in worship and keep them holy before God. So they didn't have time to be working land. Amen. Their job was to help minister to the people and preach to the people the word of God. However, that didn't work well because the people didn't do what they were supposed to do. If you fast forward, if you look at the book of Malachi chapter 3, when it talks about what a man robbed God. The backdrop of that, 70 years plus had passed and they had gone into captivity. And what was happening is the priesthood was corrupt, corrupt, the people were corrupt, and guess what? God's house was neglected. So in other words, there was no worship going on in God's house. And so that's why he asked that question. He said, will a man rob God? And then they had the nerve to stick out their chest and say, how are we robbing you? And he tells them, by your tithes and offerings. Then he says, bring your tithes into my house so there be meat, meat, be meat in my house. He didn't say bring tithes into your house. He said bring them to my house. Because the importance of that is that in order to further the gospel of Jesus Christ, what God does is allow us to participate with the financial resources that he has blessed us with. Amen? They weren't doing that. So guess what the priests had to do? The priests had to go out and fend for themselves. So when they had to go out and fend for themselves, there was no preaching going on. What you want to do, if you want us as pastors, let me put it in a modern day term for you. If you want us to be fresh and you want us to be able to deliver the word of God, then you cannot have us doing everything else that you should be helped doing. I didn't get many amens on that one. Let me say it again. Because the time that we spend doing things that you can help do is going to take us away from doing the things that God needs us to be doing. Amen. This is why some pastors never, ever study. Because their members don't give them time. Because people will forgive you for some things. You can be there for them a thousand times. But that one time that you just couldn't, your schedule didn't allow it. Maybe you attended to your own family, but they will hold that against you because you wouldn't be there. This is how parishioners treat their pastors. Amen. Which is why a lot of pastors leave ministry. Every day. This is a collective effort. This is a team effort. Amen. What if nobody in your house wanted to clean up? How well would that go? What if nobody wanted to wash dishes? Wash clothes, make beds, vacuum floors, sweep floors, mop. What if nobody wanted to do any of that? And you were the only one, and there's 12 of y'all in the house. How well would that go for you? You'll be one miserable person. Amen? Because you clean up after all them people. And you are not getting any help. Amen? This is what weary preachers in the Old Testament. They wouldn't get any help. And that's why they would cry out to God about them lazy people that God had put them in there to preach to and to lead. Amen? Up until this time, they had, they had all the battles had taken place. Only thing is that people did not fully obey God. The Canaanites were so bad and so evil, God did not want them in that land. He didn't want them pushed out and he wanted them dead. And he wanted his people in that land by themselves. And that if any foreigners came in after that, then they were supposed to adopt their ways and their laws because they were supposed to be a, re, uh, be a re reflection of God's glory. So when strangers came in, that that's what they would see. Do you realize that's still the principle that God used today? When people see me and you, what do they see? They're supposed to see Jesus Christ. They're supposed to. I'm not saying what they, say, what they actually see. I'm just saying what they're supposed to see. Amen? Because more Christian people than ran people out of churches than 
than unsaved people and ran people out of churches. Amen? So at this point, the people are already disobedient. The people had not done, and God left the people there as a thorn to them. And then it says in verse 6, when Joshua dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work the Lord which he had done for Israel. Verse 8 said, then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his, his inheritance in timnath in the hill country of Ephraim, not north of Mount Gash. All the nations... All that nations also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work he had done for Israel. How sad ain't so. How are people growing up in your family and they know not the Lord? You know him. Why nobody else in your family know him? Why is it that maybe your grandfather knew him? But you don't know him. What happened? Because at this time, they didn't have a written text for everybody. Like we can carry around as many Bibles as we want on our phones, tablets, a written word. At that time, the way they learned the word of God, it was passed down th- from the parents. And they would go to the temple and they would hear the priests proclaim truth and explain to them the holiness of God through scripture. So they were constantly reminded of what God said. That lets you know they didn't go to church anymore. That lets you know that nobody was saved anymore. That lets you know that they weren't following God anymore. And so there arose a generation after Joshua's generation. And it says that it rose this new generation. Don't have a clue who God is. That's America today. America knows not the Lord. There are generations in America in different places in the continent of Africa and different other places. They don't know the Lord. Because somebody failed and dropped the ball and somebody not telling them who the Lord is and what he has done. Amen. You don't have to know a whole lot of verses, but at least you should know John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because if you're saved, you got a testimony. Amen. And if you got a testimony, somebody should know your testimony, not just by what you say, but how you live. And the way you live should draw people to Christ. Amen? At least if you're doing it right. And so, the third point is this. How does this book of Judges describe the failures of a nation that is supposed to be a Christian nation? The third point is this. America is filled to stick with God, just like Israel. There's a time in our history when black folk were struggling so bad in the United States they didn't know where else to turn they couldn't turn to white America because white America was not on their side for the most part so guess what they turned they turned to heaven and they began to write songs and sing songs like I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain amen amen and some people still singing that song today. Go figure. And the reason why their struggle was so real, that they went to God. And God is the one who had got them through slavery. God is the one who had gotten us through as a people through one of the most difficult times we had ever faced as people. And some of that struggle still continues today. But you know what's wrong with us today? It's because we thought that all we had to do was get the same jobs that white people have. All we had to do is drive the same cars and live in the same houses. We think we'd be fine. But the problem is, is God allowed us to taste some success. The only problem is the success has taken us out of the church. And most of us find ourselves in a club. Amen. We find ourselves in places that God never intended us to be. Amen. Amen. So all of those Negro spirituals don't mean anything to us today. Because once we thought we arrived or believe we arrived, guess what we stopped doing? Worshiping. We stopped worshiping God. And normally when people are oppressed, God will only allow you to press them so much and so far. Because what happened in this text is that even though they were disobedient, you still saw an act of God's divine grace. Because God came to their rescue. God came to rescue. Look at verse 11. 
So America has failed to stick with God, just like Israel. The sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Baals are the gods of the Canaanites. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. They, thus they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, some of y'all can relate to this. Because you raise your kids in church. Guess what? They don't go to church now. Why? Because they got grown. Yeah. And so they don't have nothing to do. Or they want the blessings of God. But they don't want the obedience of God to go along with that. In other words, they want privileges, not responsibility. Amen. And they will tell you how blessed they are. But they don't do anything to bless God back. And if you remind them of that, guess what? They get offended. They'll stop calling you for a couple of days, maybe in a week or more. They'll stop coming to your house. Because every time they come to your house, why you want to talk to me about Jesus? I already know who he is. You obviously don't, so I got to tell you again. I got to remind you. That's kind of how it was then for them. They forsook the Lord and served the bells. Verse 14 said, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he gave them into the hands of the plunders and plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. This response of God is, the, is for the unfaithfulness of Israel was no surprise. He specifically promised that he would do this in the covenant he had made with Israel, which was characterized by the blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience in Deuteronomy 28. When God tells them, Today, if you listen to my voice, blessed will you be in the city, blessed will you be in the country, blessed will you be in the field, blessed will you be when you go out, blessed will you be when you come in. Everything you put your hands to, I will bless. Then look at verse 15. But if you refuse to obey, cursed will you be in the city, cursed will you be in the field, and on and on and on. He had warned them. He had warned them, if you portray this behavior, what I'm going to do to you. The worst thing that God can do is turn you over to yourself. And he turned them over there to themselves. As a result, the enemy attacked them. The enemy beat on them. The enemy treated them bad. All because the anger of the Lord burned against you. You don't ever want the anger of the Lord to burn against you like that. But your disobedience will bring out the anger of God against you. Instead of God fighting for them, God was fighting against them. So who are you going to tell if your heavenly father is fighting against you? Who can whoop your heavenly father and make him stop? It's like, you know, when you're a kid and your parents get after you. And one sibling goes tell the other sibling that dad just whooped me. As though that sibling can go whoop dad. You know, it's kind of like that. Who are you going to complain to when the person around you is bigger than you and controls all the rules and makes all the decisions? Who? Who, who can you tell? Nobody, because ain't nobody bigger than God. Amen. There's nobody bigger than God. So if God allows this to happen to you, all you can do is complain. It's not going to fix it. One thing you can do is understand why God is spanking me. Why is he testing me? Why is he putting me through this? Because you, you have to ask yourself, what have I done to bring this on myself? And that's the first thing you should ask when you face trouble. Pull out your sin checklist and figure out what have I done wrong? Because it might be because you have done something wrong and you're still doing it wrong. And if you don't ever plan on correcting it, God's going to keep spanking you. And he's going to still allow your enemies and everybody else to take advantage of you. Verse 15, look at this. Wherever they went, <laughs> the hand of the Lord was against them for evil as the Lord had spoken, as the Lord had sworn to them, so that they were severely distressed. That's an introduction. Now it gets to the verse we really want to talk about. Just a quick recap. Look at verse 16. This shows you God's divine grace. In the midst of their sin and them crying out, guess what God did? He sent them a deliverer. That deliverer was called a judge, by the way. 
Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. Judges were heroic leaders to rescue them from calamity. God did this nevertheless, not because Israel ever deserved such a deliverer from God, but in spite of the fact that they were undeserving. But here's the key. They were still God's people. Amen. The role of judges were, was an act of divine grace, but just like us today, they did not appreciate God's divine grace. Verse 17 said, yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot and the other judges and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in, in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not they did not do as their fathers did. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of the enemies and all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. These judges were successful even in those times because the anointing of God was with them. Amen. If you want to be successful in these times, you want to make sure the anointing of God is with you. Amen. And God is not going to be with you in this anointing if you don't live right. You're not obedient. You're not what you're supposed to be. You don't do the things you're supposed to do. You just want to collect all the blessings of God. But you never, ever want to do what God told you to do or called you to do. Then God's divine favor and power will not rest in you. Amen. It will not be available to you. Amen. And because of that, this calamity, in verse 19 it says, that fell upon them. Again, verse 18, when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies and all the days of the judge for the Lord was moved to pity by the groaning because of those who had oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judges died that they turned back. Say it ain't so. God had delivered them. They cried out and God delivered them. God answered their prayers. But as soon as that judge died, as soon as that leader died, they reverted back to their old ways. And then for 20 to 40 years, God would let them stay there. Could you imagine? Could you imagine crying out to God and he don't answer you for 40 years? All because of your sin? I mean, once again, because of God's divine grace and favor, he once again, he raised up another judge. And that judge would deliver them from the oppression of their enemies. And as soon as that judge died, they went back. It was a cycle of sin that's repeated as it relates to Israel in the text. So again, verse 20 says, so the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and has not listened to my voice. The worst thing you can do is not listen to God's voice. The reason why you don't listen to God's voice, most people don't know what God's voice sounds like. Think of that for a second. You both be a Christian, but you don't even know, you can't discern God's voice. How do you discern someone's voice? When my wife calls me, and all she has to do is start talking, how do I know that's her voice? One, because nobody else has that voice. <laughs> Number two is because of the familiarity and the intimacy, and I've been hearing that voice for over 30 years. I'm familiar with it. She don't have to say this me. And the reason why is because I'm so familiar with the voice that I know who that is. See, we're not familiar with God's voice because we don't know who that is. Because <laughs> we don't talk with him. We don't walk with him. You know what's odd about that? Is the fact that in the Bible, every time God spoke to somebody, whether saved or not, they knew it was God. You want an example? Look at Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is on his way to Damascus with letters in hand to lock up so these Christians can be locked up and killed when he got to Tarsus. And it said that God showed himself to him and blinded him. He fell off his horse. And you know what Saul said? God said, Saul, Saul. And he had never had a conversation with God before. But look what he says. Who art thou, Lord? Who are that Lord? And then he responds 
I'm Jesus whom you've been persecuting. The irony of all that is that he didn't believe that Jesus existed. Up until that point, he had never had a relationship with him. He had never had an encounter with him. But when he had an encounter with Jesus, he had an encounter with God because Jesus is God. Amen. So the way that you know that you have an encounter with God because you had an encounter with Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. Amen. You don't know what you think you know because you're trying to get some other religion, get your back door in the way in. There's no such thing as a back door when it comes to a walk with God, a relationship with God. Amen. We have to understand. In this day and time. The reason why we got to understand what's going on is because God is not playing. And he is coming back. But when he comes back, you got to ask yourself, will I be ready? But some of us are going to say, Lord, I wasn't ready because you know, it was that old pandemic thing. I, I wasn't ready, Lord. The political atmosphere was going on in the nation at the time. Lord, I wasn't ready because I was caught up in all of that. I wasn't ready because my family was in turmoil. I, I just wasn't ready. Lord, I wasn't ready because my family didn't want to go to church and I didn't want to disappoint them. I didn't want to go by myself. Uh, so I wasn't ready. Do you realize that's not going to fly in that day? Because it's not going to matter whether you, uh, w- the reason why you're not ready. The only thing God's going to care about is the fact that you're not ready. And you should have been ready because he gave you ample time. Because each day that God delays his coming is a day of grace for me and you. A day of grace to get things right between us and God. Every day he delays is an opportunity for us to get things right. Finally, because America has not obeyed the Lord, how has God responded? How has God responded? Well, he responds to us the same way, in similar ways he responded to Israel. The first thing he responded is the anger of the Lord was burned against them. Burns against America. America may be as wealthy as it is. We may have more advantages, schools, and all those kind of things. But we're one of the most sinful nations in the world. And I'm sure when, when, when our folks come from around the world and they come to America, I guarantee you they thought different of America before they got here. Because we have perpetuated an image that doesn't exist around the world. And then people come and learn and walk among us. And they say, y'all live in a society that's no different than the crooked government I grew up under. And all the crooked politics I grew up under. Something should change, shouldn't it? And who should lead the way? The body of Christ should lead the way. Again, verse 20 says, so the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant. You know what transgressed means? The Bible uses a different word for sin. It uses iniquity. It uses the word sin. And it also uses the word transgression. Well, transgression is a type of sin where you cannot say, I didn't know any better. Because to transgress means you, you, you go against what God had told you. So when you transgress the Lord, that's actually worse than not ever knowing. Oh, you get what I'm saying? And because you should have known any better, but you didn't do any better, then God owes you a big whipping. Not not the little tap that we get, you know, our kids to get them straightened up. I'm talking about them one from the north all the way down to the south. What a rod of correction hits the seat of understanding. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all been there before. Some of y'all might be there still now. Amen. So again, because America has not obeyed God, how has God responded? The Lord has allowed us to deal with our mess on our own. Because we don't turn to God. We still trying to find the right politician to make things right. Amen. We still trying to find the right preacher to make things right. We, we, we still trying to find the right church to make things right. But we ain't looking for God to make things right. We looking for all these other areas and sources that people are powerless to, uh, to do anything and we're not looking to God. He said, I will also, verse 21, I will, uh, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nation which God had left him. 
We not only have problems in America, we import problems. <laughs> we inherit problems and we import problems. Do we not? Because we just refuse to do it God's way. Just as simple as teaching our kids to pray. If you really teach your kids to be a prayer warrior, guess what? The government's not going to stop them from praying. In fact, the government can't stop them from praying. The government can't stop you from praying. Amen. You got to ask yourself if being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to lock you up? Many of us would go free. Nobody would bother us. Ain't enough evidence. <laughs> not enough evidence. I mean, we blend so well. We're communion Christians. We, we, we blend in so well with the black ground, people can't tell. So when people see that, like, hey, hey, boy, is that you? Is, is that you? Because you blend in so well. You talk like them, you walk like them, act like them, react like them, and all of that. When the Bible says we should be uh, peculiar people. Finally, the third, last point. Again, because America has not obeyed God, how has God responded? The Lord continues to test us, meaning discipline us because of our sins. Look at verse 22 again. In order to test Israel by them, whether they will keep the way of the Lord. In other words, God allowed the enemy to continue to attack them and to test them. See, God already knew what they were going to do and what going to do. So why does it use that language so God can see what they're going to do? It's because God already knew what they was going to do, so God was showing them what they are going to do. So he's not saying it for his benefit. He was saying it for ours. Amen? So note, here we get some insight into God's mysterious ways. He said he would leave Israel a problem. Some Canaanites within their borders specifically to test Israel. You might ask yourself, why does God leave all these problems and the church sit in the middle of all that? Why does he leave all of that? Because the goal is God has already decided what he's going to do to the lost and unsaved. He has already prepared a place. It's called the lake of fire. Amen. But see, the problem I believe God has is with us. Because we claim we his people. Amen. But we don't live like his people. People have to bribe us to come to church. Make us come to Sunday school. Make us come to Bible study. Make us participate. Make us come and help clean the building. Anything that's needed to further God's kingdom, we don't want to help with that. Oh, pastor, I can't come and help with that. I got a bad back. Oh, that's why you down at the juke joint shaking your rump, sir? But you got a bad back? That same bad back when you do everything else you want to do? But that same bad back? Something's wrong with that statement. Because we tend to make Time for the things that are important to us, do we not? But then God says to me and you, why are you when are you going to make time for the things that are important to me? When are you going to make times things important to me? Last verse, verse 23. So the Lord allowed those nations to remain, not drive them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. This is why Joshua never conquered all those, those lands. It wasn't Joshua's fault. It was, those, it was the people's fault. Because they didn't do what God told them to do. This showed that Israel's disobedience was costly. God allowed their enemies to remain with their, within their borders to be a thorn to them even to this very day. God will do the same thing to me and you. Because we just won't straighten up and live right. We claim we're Christians, but there's nothing Christ-like about us. There's nothing Christ-like within us. And so we just make excuses of why we can't show up on time, why we can't do what we're supposed to do, why can't we can't support the ministries, why we can't tithe, why we can do the whole host of things that Christians ought to be doing. But let me tell you something today. Today is a turning point. You don't have to leave here the same way you came. Today is a turning point. Amen? You can choose to make a different choice today. You can choose to take a different path today. You can choose to respond to what God just said to you in this message. Or you can not choose. Or you can just act like everything is fine. And that that message was somebody else. Because I'm okay. 
I don't have to do any more than I've been doing now. And you know that's not true. God knows it's not true. But some ought to stir you within you to give God your very best. Each of us tend to give 100% in areas that we are dedicated to. Do we not? How many of you all enjoyed winning awards on your job? Being commended for doing a great job. Amen. If I had my military uniform on right now, there's a rack of medals and stuff. If I wore my mesh dress, you could see just how impressive that looks. See, in the service dress, they're small and square. If you ever saw me in my mesh dress, it has the big medallion kind of medals that hang on my chest. And you can kind of tell some of the things that I've been awarded for because of you understand what the medal means. Amen. See, you can achieve all of that in this life and still go to hell. And you don't have any crowns, any jewels in your crown where you're supposed to be a Christian. Because that's how God judges. Because the Bible says we're going to lay our crowns at his feet. And what that means is even though these crowns and these jewels are going to be some of our most proud accomplishments of what we did for the kingdom, because we meet the king himself, we just lay those crowns at his feet because you know why? Because we have access to the king himself. Finally. And what that crown says, and the Jews in that crown, it says anybody who's paying attention, that was a faithful servant. That was a faithful servant. But I believe that some of y'all are going to show up and your crown going to be empty. It ain't going to have no bling. It ain't going to be shiny. You're just going to squeak your way in probably if that was even possible. Because nothing about like your life now screams, I'm a Christian. That I do anything for the kingdom. And the only time you want to do anything is somebody has to recognize you and call you out for it. You can't just do it because God said do it. Amen. Oftentimes, being a pastor is a thankless job. It really is. Because you never get thankful for all that you, we actually do. But those of us who do it for the right reasons, that's not why we do it. We do it because we want thanks from God, not praise of man. Amen? Amen? And only difference between me and you is function. I'm not more important to God than you are. But you have to decide today whether I'm, I'm going to fulfill my function in the body of Christ. Oh, I'm not going to be, oh, be so caught up with the issues and things I face in my house and my kids, all the dilemma and drama that I'm going through. Because if you're not careful, you'll make bad decisions because you're making decisions. Not because God told you. Because the drama is your life leads you to. And you don't listen to wise counsel. And it's important that we listen to wise counsel. That we understand that we can walk in the ways and things of God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you now. We thank you, O oh God, that you are present, help in trouble. You are everything to us. You are God, our Lord, our King, our everything. But today, O oh God, we're struggling, we're hurting, and we need your help. Lord, we heard you loud and clear, O oh God, in this message today. We as a nation claim to be this godly nation. We as a church claim to be godly people. But just like the nation, look, we've offended you in a lot of ways. We're not where we're supposed to be. We're not doing what we're supposed to do. But today, Lord, we want to come clean. And we want to commit our lives to you. And for those of us, some of us, we need to recommit our lives to you. Lord, we'll no longer allow this pandemic to get in our way. We'll no longer allow the racial unrest in the United States and around the world to get in the way. We'll no longer allow our politics to get in the way. We'll no longer allow our opinions to get in the way. We'll no longer allow our attitude and anger to get in the way. And we'll no longer allow our family to get in the way. And our friends, and our jobs, our careers, our school. Today, oh God, we come between before you. And if you want to make things right with God today, just pray this simple prayer. Me and say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I admit that I've sinned. And Lord, right now, I want to make things right between me and you. I don't want to leave here, oh God, the same way as I came. 
Well, I don't want to take this opportunity to accept this invitation you're giving. Father, I pray you make things right in my life. Even things I've made wrong. I accept Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. And even if I prayed this before, Lord, I'm praying it now. Because right now I want to recommit myself to you. That I may walk with you and talk with you. No matter what anybody else around me does, Lord, from this day forward, you can count on me. I will do your will. And I will be about your business. I trust in you. I love you. I adore you. And I thank you for all that you have done and continue to do in my life. And it's only reasonable, God, that I bless you back because you have blessed me so much. It's only reasonable, God, as your word says, a reasonable service. Because of all that you have done, you stretched out your arms on Calvary's cross and died in my place. You died for my sins. You died in order I could live. And because you died in order I could live, Lord, I just want to live for you. I want to die to self. I want to die to sin. And I want to live for you in Christ is my prayer. Thank you for saving me. Now, God, I pray that you teach me, train me, fill me, bless me, and use me. For my good and for your glory, I pray. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. The call this morning is the call to come follow the Lord. The call this morning is the call to foresee the distractions around us. To not let where we live or where we dwell determine our lives. But to let only Jesus determine who we are and what we do. Sweetly Lord, how we are be calling. Come follow me. And we see what the prints fall in me. Doesn't mean wherever God leads you. All along by Silo, I've spent help in the week. In the week. Wherever the Lord sends you to, you say, Lord. voices alone now. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. 
Lord help you and I this week. Amen. As we walk in all our ways to just listen to Jesus and to follow his footsteps wherever he leads us. Amen. Amen. Good Lord hand of praise. I hope that you've been moved by today's message. If you'd like to hear the message again, you can go to our website and hear this in entirety. In fact, you go back six years, you can let, look at sermons and listen to messages. You can pull up your, your phone, and all you have to do is go to our website. It will link you uh, to the YouTube connection where they're stored, and there are various messages on there that you can listen to. And I hope that you've been encouraged today. We live in a world that's going through some very challenging times. When the posters go out and they're always interviewing people and they talk about how angry the, the country is. I don't know about you is because God has blessed me. I don't live in anger. Amen. When you walk with Jesus and following his steps, then you don't have to be time to be angry about everything. Amen. Because as a believer, you should have the joy and peace in life no matter what the country is, the country is going through. Amen. We know that many people in this country and around the world don't walk with God, so why are we surprised when they act the way they do? And many people are looking for hope and deliverance through politicians and governors and mayors and elected officials and people. We see it all the time. But that should not be where we stand because you and I are supposed to stand with Christ. Amen. Amen. So we also encourage you to go to our website and you can click and you can give and donate to the ministry here at Agape. There's various ways you give. You can do it electronically. Uh, there's a place on the website where you can do that. And also, you can mail it to the church. And you can do it that way. So we hope that you would tell someone about what you learned today. That you'd strike up a conversation and find someone, a family, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, Somebody you can talk to them about the joy of Jesus Christ and knowing him and walking with him. Amen? Amen. Jesus loves you, we do too. We hope to see you on Wednesday night where we expound on this text a little bit further. We meet at 7 o'clock, so we hope that you join us at 7. We're trying to get people offline and in person. We also would try to get you here for Sunday school because our Sunday school is not online. Our Sunday school teachers always do an exceptional job. And I'm going to challenge you to get more involved here at Agape, that you come and at least get the teaching, that you come on time and you get the sermons and be a part of the church that you say you are a member of. Amen? And so let us stand for our benediction. We want to thank God for this day. We still want to pray for the families who have been affected by 9-11, uh, and there are many. We want to pray for all our military personnel because things in the military change as well from 9-11. And all the things that we continue to face today, we still want to pray because we realize that we are not a nation under God, but we can be people under God. Amen. If everybody else don't want to walk with God, that's their business. But it should never, ever stop you from walking with God and you being a person under God. Amen. Amen. We see your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. May you go forth today in the power and the love of Jesus Christ. Whatever you're lacking, may God not only meet it, but he'd exceed it. May he bless you forevermore and that he bless you continuously to be a blessing. And may he watch between me and you until we meet again as I pray. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Reach your neighbor before you depart. Amen.